Welcome back to Insert Art. Today we are inserting cartoon characters into Renaissance paintings. You know how like in Spongebob where like every now and then they'll have like a scene that is like really overly painted and really gross oh. and really like zoomed in. Like that gross like realistic zoomed in yeah. Squidward. So I think that's sort of the inspiration of what we're going to do today. But we're actually going to make it look nice. We're going to make it look like a beautiful portrait of the Renaissance era. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking Scooby-Doo. I think Scooby-Doo doesn't get enough love. I think there's not enough um, realistic paintings of Scooby-Doo. Yeah, so I'm thinking maybe him as like a noble sitting on a chair. He is a, a great Dane. He is a great Dane. And I will be painting Aang Let's go. from Avatar. I'm always doing the avatars. I mean, different avatars, but Yeah, avatars. <laughs> I think that would suit you though. I think you've got a good grasp on Aang. I think we've got a pretty good plan. I think we should just get started. Let's do it. So starting off with my artwork, I decided to start with the background this time, which is a little bit unconventional for me, but I knew that I wanted to get some really nice painterly textures down right away. And Jazz's ultimate digital brush pack was absolutely perfect for it. It's got this amazing selection of oil paints. So I made sure to go in a nice diagonal sort of direction just to get a really even sort of coverage and to get that extra bit of texture. I also made sure to go for brushes that have a little bit of color variation. Off the top of my head, I think I use the wet brush mostly and maybe also the dry blend and maybe even a little bit of watercolour. I know the watercolours have got some mm. really nice colour variations. Just making sure that the corners are darkest so you've got that really nice vignette that is so common in classical paintings. And with that nice dark background, I actually opted for the construction pencil, which is this really nice pale blue colour. And actually, it just felt right at the time. It just like popped a little bit more against that dark background. The Scooby-Doo is a Great Dane, so I used references of Great Danes, and that's sort of where I got this realistic sort of dog anatomy and proportions. But you've got the Scooby-Doo pose with his chest like really far out. Yeah, I was kind of going for, you know in Renaissance paintings where like it's usually some sort of like lieutenant or like soldier who's oh, like... Someone who's very decorated. Yeah, he's yeah. like covered in war medals mm. and this is sort of the pose that I was going for. Like, oh yeah. And it also like perfectly matches the pose in the reference. I know it's probably a bit exaggerated because it's a comic, but I just thought that this pose was like an ode to the cartoon. It works so well on both ends though. And then using a soft brush and just adding some different sort of colors to Scooby's face. Realistic Great Danes tend to have a bit of a darker coloration around the, mm -hmm. the muzzle and the eyes. He's kind of going through like a very scary, ugly phase right now where his eyes are just kind of these two little beads. and. <laughs> <laughs> As an experienced artist, when do you know that it's just something that will get fixed down the road and you just have to trust the process versus like, oh, that's a mistake, I need to fix it? I think at this stage I hadn't added lighting and I think lighting is probably the most transformative thing that is in my personal art process. So um, I knew once I added lighting it would all become a little bit clearer. It is kind of an intuitive thing though. I think if I can pinpoint exactly what is not comfortable for me and exactly what I want to change. Like at this stage I knew the, the eyes were just too dark and I mm. knew I was going to add some lighter tones and maybe even a little bit of colour just to draw yeah. our attention to the eyes and I knew that that was something that would immediately fix it mm. so I just trusted the process as you say mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. just kept going. But oftentimes in my art process I'll get stuck on something and intuitively I know that it doesn't look right but I just can't figure out what it is and mm. that's sort of one of those times where I'm like okay Maybe I'll take a step back, mm. um, go back to fundamentals and sort of see what it is that isn't working and try to work it out and try to make it more fixable. There was one thing that I sort of really wanted to add to this Renaissance painting, which isn't traditional or classical in any way, but I thought it would be a little bit more fun than just a plain old portrait. So I added a ghost behind Scooby. Um, <laughs> <laughs> originally, I kind of wanted him looking very proud of himself, but then um, eventually he sort of ends up looking a little bit scared like as if he's heard this ghost behind him and he's just about to do a slow turn around to, to see, Aww. see it eventually. During his photo shoot, it's still yeah, being haunted. Exactly. I also made the ghost silly enough that it could be believable in a Scooby-Doo episode. Mm. So like this ghost 
just looks like a holograph that's been like projected onto like a smoke machine or something. Yeah. Which is very Scooby Doo, I feel. They always like <laughs> take the mask off and yeah. realize that it's just smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Also, adding this ghost in the background just meant that I could sort of bring Scooby's silhouette out a little bit more, having that lighter background and the darker character in the front. I think worked a little bit better than just having it dark on dark. And with this ghost came the beautiful opportunity to add some rim light, so I made sure to do that. And already Scooby-Doo is popping so much more. And I know I wanted to go for a really dramatic, high contrast lighting that you often see in a Renaissance painting. And the lighting is also sort of coming from the top, so it kind of looks like he's being spotlighted. I'm making sure to add lots of hue variation in Scooby's fur as well. One thing that I absolutely love about classical paintings is how they paint animals because they just make them look so shiny. Like if it's a horse or a dog or anything like that, they make sure that the fur looks really shiny. And they do this by adding lots of color variation and having lots of contrast, even adding light hues where you probably won't expect it and dark hues as well. So you can see I've got some really light hues towards the bottom where he's like, elbow joint is, but also some really dark hues sort of towards the light mm. and even like on his nose where you kind of expect it to be bright but because it's it's shiny and reflective it might actually be reflecting something dark. I hope oh. that makes sense. It was at this stage where I turned to Ariel and I was like I am so scared because I want to merge all of my layers but I'm, I'm very scared. But I worked up the courage and I merged all of my layers together. Um, and I did it because with these traditional classical Renaissance oil paintings, they don't have the luxury of layers. They just kind of do it all in one layer and it means that you get some really blurry edges and you don't rely on things like the lasso tool, clipping masks, things like that. Wow, that I are... feel very attacked right now with all these things. <laughs> All the things that are native to Photoshop and that are meant to help you, but I thought this would be a fun challenge for myself. And it would also help me sort of blur the sharp edges that I've got going on and make it look really painted. Did you regret it in the end? I didn't regret it in the end. In the end, it was a good decision. Oh, those whiskers. Just having those like really bright whiskers on the back side of Scooby and having those really dark whiskers on the front of Scooby, it brought like an extra dimension. And it was also a reference to his cartoon drawing because he's actually got like two little whiskers on his chin. Oh, does he? In the cartoon, yeah, oh, okay. he does. I do add some to his chin later on as well because I was like, he needs some chin whiskers. So I actually use the smoke brush from Jazz's Ultimate Digital Brush Pack, which was so fun to use. I love this brush more than anything, but it was looking a little bit photo bashed and a little bit out of place in the whole image. So I made sure to go over it with those lovely oil brushes and just give it a little bit of thickness and a little bit of three-dimensionality just to have it looking like it was painted there as well. It's funny that we both ended up with um, blue and brown. Did you end up with blue because and you brown Because well? you started brown background, blue sketch. I started blue background, brown sketch. No way! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually kind of a, a subconscious thought, I think. Brown and blue work so well together because mm. they are opposites on the colour wheel because brown is just like a dark orange. Um, and obviously Scooby-Doo's colours are brown and blue, like just on his own. Oh yeah, there you are. And last but not least, I just added some texture with the spatter brush, just to kind of look like maybe during the painting process, some spatter happened, like maybe I was flicking the brush or something. I feel like that's a common technique used by oil painters to sort of flick the brush and get spatter. And it just, it gave it a little bit of imperfection, a little bit of texture just to really bring it all together and get that grainy effect. Also with like traditional old paintings, I feel like they tend to like crack a little bit and you tend to get like little <laughs> Yeah. little specks of dust and little mm. bit of like textural elements that you don't yeah. really want but um, I think it really adds to the aesthetic. And that is my Scooby-Doo painted as a renaissance uh, Painting. Decorated war hero. He is. <laughs> he is. He's fought a lot of ghosts in his time, but will he defeat the ghost that's behind him? And <laughs> is that ghost 
actually a ghost. And if you want to learn all the other secret ways that we take our artworks to completion, you are just going to have to join us on Patreon. Our secret ways. Just today, Ariel filmed her first tutorial, so congratulations Ariel. It was good fun. Yeah, we taught everyone about anatomy and proportions, and that is available to our master tier, our diver tier, and our doublet tier. And if you're not interested in tutorials, then we also do master classes, where we have a look at your artwork and we give advice and critiques and feedback. Patrons also get to vote on our tutorial content. They get access to all of our Discord. And our master patrons get an extra special little hand-drawn doodle that you get to see at the end of every video. These are our favorite patrons because we get to chat with them one-on-one -on -one in our master classes. We get to know them and they are honestly just the best. My favorite part is seeing them grow. Absolutely, already. They have taken on all of the feedback that we've given them and their artwork is improving immensely. All right, back to awesome art. Ariel, you're on the chopping block. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I began by gathering reference for both Aang as well as classic slash Renaissance portraits. And I was just looking at the oil paint release style and thinking that, look, it takes a long time to really break down a style like that and implement it. And I don't know a whole lot. So, you know, all your art history buffs, people who actually have an art education can add me in the comments. And I, I was in a bit of a dilemma at the start. I didn't know whether to keep Aang cartoonish in his proportions and in his classically recognizable look or actually try and turn him into like more realistic. How would you describe your style? Because you are the newest member mm. on Insert Art and I feel like a lot of our viewers and me as well, we haven't seen enough of your art. <laughs> How would you describe it yourself? That's a great question and I don't know the answer. To me, I feel like I haven't found a style. I probably sit somewhere in the middle between realism and cartoony, which means that I'm often at risk of falling into the uncanny valley. <laughs> Okay, maybe you can tell me how you would describe my style as we go through this video. Okay, at the end of this artwork, yeah. I'll let you know. Because like it's too in my face, like I'm just doing what I do. I don't know how to step back and describe it. I think for every artist, finding their own style is pretty elusive. Mm. Like you're always the student, never the master. And it's sort of this never ending quest to yeah. find your artistic style. I think style is something that um, beginners shouldn't worry about. There's so much more foundation that they need to build first. You, you can obviously have a preference and know what you like and build towards that. But your fundamentals of like anatomy, proportion, um, perspective, etc. That is going to be applicable across most styles. Absolutely. All the stuff that we taught in our tutorial today. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> oh, I actually had to go and ask the rest of the office whether I should draw Young Ang. That we had an office vote. Yeah, we? Well, we always an put everything poll. to an office poll. Um, whether I should draw Young Ang or older Ang, but I think Young Ang is the most recognizable. So although I didn't know how to implement all the elements of what makes a Renaissance painting a Renaissance painting, I said, let's go with the, with the story of it. So this is the first time Ang's getting his picture taken this picture done <laughs> because maybe they don't have cameras I guess you know as I was roughing out this sketch I just kept seeing this scene in my mind and I was trying to make Ang look serious because this is like his equivalent of having like his king's portrait done yeah serious moment but he's Ang and just in my head he refused to be serious <laughs> he's still a 12 year old kid and he just wants to let loose he doesn't want to stand there for hours being <laughs> painted and the scene that I just kept seeing like imagine you're looking at him like you're from the painter's perspective but behind Behind you, you've got Aang's entire like friend gang. And they're all waving at him yeah. and like making funny faces <laughs> and he's trying not to laugh. <laughs> so I decided that I'm just going to stick with the more cartoony style, but I would bring in like the texture brushes, the more painterly strokes. Something else that makes it more painterly rather than anime is that I did an underpainting with complementary colors and let those hues show through in the shadows. Right, that's a traditional technique that mm. paint is actually use. Yeah. That's really cool that you managed to use that in a digital setting. Do you think it actually worked the same, like similarly? I think so, yeah. So for, for people who aren't familiar with what underpainting means, like if you look at my references, editors, you can just like flash that. Um, anime screenshots on. Like you'll see that the shadows are just a darker version of the main color. Like on his cape, uh, the shadows are just a dark orange. On his pants, the shadows are just a dark yellow. But what I'm doing here is putting like deep blues everywhere and where the shadows are deepest, they actually go towards blue rather than the original yellow or orange. 
Uh, the challenge with the underpainting was, so because blue and orange are complementaries, they cancel each other out and become grey. So like blue has to go through grey in order to become orange. Yeah. And what that means is in a piece like this, you run the risk of things looking muddy and desaturated. So there's a part of the process where I'm just um, trying to bump up the saturation in the right places without losing the hints of blue in the shadows, which is like the whole purpose of having those blues in the first place. How do you navigate? trusting that process. I don't. You know? <laughs> I just hope. <laughs> I don't trust, I hope. No, no, but how do I trust the process with that? I think I've learned to be a bit more daring with leaving unexpected colours in certain places because I think maybe if I had done this painting a year ago, I would have been very insecure about leaving the blue showing through. I would have just covered everything up and then I would have lost the unpainting altogether. And then you would just have a flat orange. Yeah, and there's no point no, no doing the blues. No shape to it, you know? Yeah. I really like how saturated the orange is because it makes sense that the, the shadows would retain the, the ambient light of the room. Mm. So the shadows would be a more blue sort of colour, but then anything that is lit by a light source would ha have a really nice strong saturation, which you've done here. Okay, so this was the part where I needed to have faith and trust the process, because once I put in his eyes and they just look so googly, I was like, oh gosh. And the problem is, and this is sort of an uncanny valley thing as well, because yeah. the big eyes with the small pupils, they work in 2D style. Yeah. But once you start trying to flesh it out, make it 3D at that realistic lighting and form, it gets so ugly. <laughs> <laughs> there was a moment when he suddenly clicked to life for me. And also I had this light bulb moment because I was struggling so hard with his eyes. I was like, how do I make him look nice? I mean, I know he's trying to be silly, but at the same time, like, the, like things just weren't lining up. His pupils weren't looking in the same direction. <laughs> it was just off. And then I remembered in, I think, the first book, there is a character called King Bumi. King Bumi is the king of the Earth Kingdom and they fight him pretty early on in the series. He's like super old, grizzled, and like his eyes are always like puffy and like one eye is like half closed. <laughs> and he turns out to be Aang's childhood friend from a hundred years ago before Aang got frozen in the iceberg. And so I could just see Aang now getting his like king portrait done. He's probably got Bumi in the back of his head. He's just like pulling Bumi faces. <laughs> and so I was like, yes, this is how I deal with his eyes. For me, the eyes are always the part that I have to really like nail down because it sets the tone of the rest of the piece. They're the windows to the soul. Mm. So once I made that stupid expression on his face, suddenly I felt like, okay, I found him. I think I spy one of the charcoal brushes as the background texture. Mm. I love that. I I almost never used a non-textured brush in this because just having lots of texture is your shortcut to making a classical looking painting. Yeah, and making it look more detailed in the process as well. Oh yeah. I love how you've kept anime proportions but you're doing the like painterly style. I think it's a really unique combination. And I love that you love that because that is just something <laughs> I've been doing by default and again I don't know what to make of my style. I guess, I guess maybe, that's it. Maybe that's your style. <laughs> what, painterly <laughs> anime? <laughs> Painterly anime. I'm here for it. Yeah. And from here it was a matter of just neatening up other things, putting in details like the staff, the necklace, and then doing like a final pass with lighting and shadow. I could have been more disciplined about doing those things as neatly as I just described them. In reality, I tend to get distracted and then like fix this and fix that and start drawing a whole new thing over there. Yeah, I think one thing that I've found with drawing on a time constraint is that it really helps to draw everything at once rather than to draw every individual item separately. Mm. So then at least if you only get to like 60% done, then at least the whole artwork is 60% done rather than having yeah. some of it 100% done and some of it 5% done. Mm. I think that comes down to a discipline thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Whereas I'm just like, I like faces, yeah. I'm comfortable, so I'm just gonna like everything on the face and then I'm like, oh crap, <laughs> I have to do with like the rest of the painting. The face is the focal point though, mm. so you do need to spend that extra time on the face and that's yeah. why I always start with faces in my artwork. I really like the subtle like purple hues that you've got in the skin tone. Mm. I think you'll find with Renaissance paintings, they do actually put a little bit of green or 
a little bit of purple mm. in the skin tones and it kind of gives it like a stubble sort of look and it, it just like really brings the shadows to life and it's a really unexpected colour because you don't imagine purples and greens in yes. skin tones but it, it looks so good. I am surprised at how well those purples have come through as well. It's all that mixing blue and red, yeah. Yeah, I left the blues more on the clothes and the equivalent of the blue shadows in the skin, I pushed it more towards purple because I think blue would have just been too grey looking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, purple is blue plus red, so it brings a bit of warmth. It would be that the blue light of the room is sort of mm. um, combining with like the redness under your skin, which yep. comes from all the, the blood vessels and the, exactly. the blush that naturally happens in your skin. Yep. So it only makes sense. Mm. So for me, in terms of what makes this a quote unquote renaissance painting, it was the story behind it of like, you know, a king having his portrait painted and also losing his patience having his portrait painted. <laughs> um, doing the underpainting and using um, more textured brush strokes. I did notice that they like to make the skin quite bright and shiny, yeah. which in Photoshop terms means a lot of like overlay. Yeah, like mixing yeah. Layers. Or yeah. color dodge or linear mm. dodge or any of those lighten blending modes. Yeah. I absolutely love it. I think it is the perfect mix of like serious painting and childish <laughs> fun. And it is absolutely aerial as well. <laughs> So that is all that we've got for you today. Instead of doing two artworks each, we decided to just do one each today. And that way we can really get into the nitty gritty of this style. For any art buffs out there who understand classical painting and Renaissance painting better than we do, please feel free to share your knowledge in the comments. Tell us um, what are the other key elements that make Renaissance painting what it is and we would love to learn that. Maybe we can incorporate that next time. Personally, I consider myself a pretty painterly digital artist. So I absolutely love doing this style and I would love to do more. So if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, a comment, a subscribe, a share, all of that fun YouTube stuff. And then we could make even more. And let us know what characters you would like us to do next. I'm thinking maybe like SpongeBob could be cool or <laughs> Fred Flintstone or Powerpuff Girls. Powerpuff Girls. In that would be really cool. Painted Powerpuff. Oh, that would be so weird. They'd be like three sisters just sitting the there. The eyes. Really. Like this big. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we want to say an extra special thank you to Time Blank. Distinct Dev. I'll be the flu. Melfiel, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Slink Helix. Dominic Larson and our newest member of the Master Patreon tier, Marzi Malfoy. Marzi Malfoy. Welcome to our little club, Marzi Malfoy, and we will see you in the next video. Bye. Insert outro? Insert out. Insert out. Insert out. <laughs>